In today's video, I wanted to look at a paper that I found interesting. It's called Asymmetric Self-Play for Automatic Goal Discovery in Robotic Manipulation. And this is a paper that is still under review for the iClear 2021 conference. So the authors are anonymous, but I like the ideas in it and it presented some compelling, exciting results. So I wanted to share it with you and go over the main points of this paper that I found interesting. So first of all, we're doing robotic manipulation with a robot arm. And we're starting off with a setup like this with a bunch of objects on the table. We're trying to figure out how to arrange them. For example, if we have a goal state that looks like this or like this, and we're starting off with these pieces, how do we get them into this goal state? And this kind of addresses the question of how are we gonna communicate with robots to tell them what we want them to do? Are we gonna use natural language to describe it? Such as take these two pieces and screw them together. Or are we going to demonstrate the task a couple of times and hope they figure out the pattern? And what's done in this paper, which is pretty interesting, is they just show the robot the goal state, where they want all the pieces to end up, and they let the robot figure out how to get the objects into that goal state. And here are some demonstrations showing that it actually works. It just gives it this goal state of the table all set and looking nice, and the robot figures out how to take all these utensils and the plate and arrange them as desired. And here's another task where it's trying to arrange these balls and cylinders into this formation here. And you can see this is a pretty hard task. For example, every time it'll touch one of these balls, it kind of, it's like sliding around, it's like a block without friction. It's hard to control it. And it still figures out how to do it, which is really impressive. And then down here with the blocks, it gives it this goal state and you can see it just nicely arranges them into that new goal state, kind of had this green one fall down, but it can still pick it up. Over here, we have the rainbow. You can just slide these into place. It's kind of having a hard time with this one, but it still ends up doing a pretty good job. And we can see the two views this robot has. It has this front camera view, and it has this camera on its wrist. And it's given the goal state from the front camera view, but it can still use these two inputs to help it navigate the space. So here's another example setting up pieces for a mini chessboard. And then down here, it's just taking objects that are somewhat randomly placed and it's figuring out how to rearrange them to match the scene of the goal state. You can also do things like block stacking where it will set down the blue, put this yellowish one on top and then the green one. We can see down here, it actually learns some crazy new skills such as balancing two blocks balancing three blocks and even kind of stacking four blocks, balancing three of them and having the blue one underneath, which is pretty darn impressive. And down here, we'll see some emergent skills where it's using friction to slide up this purple block. Then over here, it's doing some manipulations with the arm that are impressive, picking it from the side and rotating it over here, picking it up, twisting it around and setting it in place. So now the question is, how are they training this robot? If you've tried training a robot arm by just showing it an end goal state and seeing if it'll figure out how to get there, you'll know it's probably not gonna learn to do anything because it'll never reach this goal state and never get that reward. So you might think let's do curriculum learning where we start off with an easier task and it'll slowly get harder and harder. And if we come down to this page of the paper, we can see how the robot learns if we do curriculum learning with distance. So here are the four tasks, push, flip, pick and place and stack. So push, we just have to push these blocks into place and it doesn't matter if they're rotated correctly. Over here, flip is the same as push except for they have to be oriented correctly. And you can see that by these letters on the blocks. And here, pick and place, you're gonna slide one block into place and then you're gonna raise this other block into the air. So here the robot has to start using its gripper to pick up the block. And then for stack, we're just gonna stack two blocks, one on top of the other. So first, if we don't use any curriculum and we just try to show it the goal state and see if it can learn, it actually won't learn anything. And even though you can't see the yellow, it's below these lines at the bottom. It mentions that at the bottom that some of the completely failed baselines are occluded by the others. So since we don't see any yellow, it means that it's down here at the bottom and it couldn't learn at all. So the next one is distance curriculum. So in this one, the blocks will start out close to the goal and the robot will only have to move the blocks a little bit. And over time, as the goal gets harder and harder, it'll have to move the blocks farther and farther. And we can see this time it can actually learn for the push and flip. 
and it still can't learn anything for the pick and place and the stack tasks where it has to use the gripper. So the next curriculum that's tried is distribution curriculum, and that's where we start off with just these easier tasks, and we slowly phase in these harder pick and place and stack tasks to see if the robot can initially learn the easy ones, and then once it's learned those, if it can later also learn to do the pick and place and stack tasks. And as we can see, the green is along the bottom or missing, so it completely fails. And then this other curriculum, we combine these two, this is the blue one, and it does a little better than the red, but still, it's not very good compared to these black lines, which are the method demonstrated in this paper where it uses self-play to train the robot. And the first time I think I became aware of how powerful self-play can be was with AlphaGo that learned to play Go and was able to beat Lee Seydal. And it started off by learning from professional games, but then after that, it would just play against itself to learn how to get better and better. And eventually it became better than any human and then after that, DeepMind came out with AlphaZero, which didn't even use the professional games at all, and it just learned from scratch how to play the game by just playing against itself. So at the beginning, it was probably really bad at playing Go, but so was its opponent. So it could still learn by learning these probably basic strategies of how to play Go, and then as its opponent, which was also itself, got better and better, it would have to learn more and more advanced strategies, but it was able to give it a learning signal so that it could improve over time. So here we're using that same idea of self-play to make the initial task easy, but have it slowly become more and more difficult over time so that it can learn how to do more complicated tasks. But now it's robot arm versus robot arm. So what they do in this paper is they start off with an initial random state where the objects are randomly placed in the environment. And then there's two robots. In this paper, they call them Alice and Bob. Alice goes first and then Bob follows. So first, Alice will interact with the environment and she can move objects around. And then Bob will try to look at the final state after Alice moved any objects around and try to move the objects into that same state. And Bob gets rewarded every time he can move objects into the correct position. And if he can move all the objects into the correct position, he gets rewarded even more. And Alice gets rewarded if she can create tasks that Bob can't complete. So it's kind of this adversarial setup where Alice is trying to make a task that Bob can't do and Bob's trying to always complete the task. So that's why they refer to this as asymmetric self-play in the title, because they don't exactly have the same task. And then after they've trained like this for a while, they test out Bob on these held out tasks, which he hasn't trained on at all, the ones that I was showing you earlier, and he's able to solve them, these more complex, elaborate tasks, just from slowly building up how to do these little tasks that Alice presents to Bob. So what are the nice things about this technique? First of all, we get an auto-generated curriculum. As Alice gets better and better at learning how to create complex tasks, the tasks that Bob has to solve are slowly getting more and more complex. So not only is the curriculum auto-generated, but we know that each of the tasks can be achieved. This is because a robot was used to actually create the task. Because Alice was able to do it, we know that Bob theoretically should be able to do it. Maybe Alice did something crazy, she just hit a block and it flew around and did some crazy flips, and that was the final state. And so it's pretty unlikely that Bob will be able to do that, but for the most part, it seems to work pretty well. And on top of that, when Bob isn't able to complete the task, we have a demonstration of the task being completed for it to follow. We have Alice's previous demonstration of completing that task that Bob can just imitate to learn how to do the same thing. So the tasks are auto-generated, we know they're achievable, and when Bob doesn't achieve them, he has a demonstration to follow. So those are the three main key points I think that makes this method really powerful. So now let's get into the details of how it actually works. So first, they'll start with the same initial state, a randomly selected sample of the objects randomly positioned in the environment. And then Alice will go first. She'll go through several time steps to rearrange the environment as much as she wants. And at the end, the environment is checked to see if it's a valid environment. So for it to be valid, she has to at least move one of the objects and there can't be any objects that fell off the table. If it's an invalid goal, this training episode is ended and we go back to the beginning. However, if she creates a valid goal, this goal is passed to Bob and Bob now has to complete that goal. So now Bob has a certain number of time steps to interact with the environment to try to reach that goal state. So Bob's network is a little bit different than Alice's because in addition to the input of the state of the environment, he also gets the input of the goal that he's trying to achieve. 
So as Bob's interacting with the environment at each of these steps, if he moves an object into place, he gets a immediate reward of plus one. And whenever he moves an object out of place that was previously in place, he gets a immediate reward of negative one. And once he gets all the objects into the goal state, his turn ends immediately, and he gets a reward of plus five. However, if he's unable to achieve his goal within the allotted time, he gets a reward of zero, and actually Alice will get a reward of plus five for having created a task that Bob couldn't complete. So once we get to the end here, we go back to the beginning, and Alice will create another task. So we just continue from where the environment left off, and she's gonna move the objects around even more. And again, we'll see if it's a valid goal that she set. And I forgot to mention last time, but after she sets the goal, she gets a reward of plus one if it is valid. She gets a reward of zero if it's not valid. But then on top of that, we check to see if all the objects are within a specified volume that is supposed to be visible from Bob's camera. So if any objects aren't in that volume, she gets a reward of negative three, a penalty, but it's still considered valid, so it doesn't immediately end this training episode. So just as before, Alice will set another goal, Bob will try to complete that goal, and they do this five times in a row. So if at any point during these five loops through this training cycle, if Bob isn't able to complete one of the tasks, his turn will be skipped next time. So for example, if he couldn't complete the third task, Alice will still continue to create a fourth and a fifth task, but Bob won't be asked to try to attempt them. They'll just be used as demonstrations for Bob to learn from in the future. Also for any tasks that Bob wasn't able to complete, then we'll take Alice's trajectory and move it into a replay buffer of demonstration tasks for Bob to learn from. So there's a lot of different parts to this training algorithm and let's take a look at the ablation studies to see which parts had the biggest effect. So here we see the black line is the full setup, the self-play that I mostly just described. And here we'll see what happens when we remove a part of the algorithm. So first, no ABC stands for no Alice behavioral cloning. And that's when we don't use Alice's demonstrations to teach Bob when he fails a task. And that has the biggest effect. When we don't use these demonstrations to teach Bob, he actually doesn't learn at all and just stays along the bottom, so completely fails. The next one is actually something I haven't mentioned yet, and this is the loss clipping. So if we go up to here where they describe the loss, the loss for Bob is both the normal RL loss from its interactions with the environment and its rewards that it received, and also it has this behavioral cloning loss which is the demonstrations from Alice on the tasks that he failed at. And they also have this parameter beta, which they can use to balance how much reward is coming from the normal RL loss and how much is coming from the behavioral cloning loss. And in the paper, they just set this to 0.5, so they're using the full percent of the normal RL loss and then only 50% of this other loss. But below, the ablation study of the clipping, what they added in was the clipping used in standard PPO which just limits how much the policy can change during these behavioral cloning updates. So what this does is that as Bob is learning to imitate Alice, it limits how much he can change his policy. So for example, if in one of Alice's demonstrations, she's recommending Bob take a certain action from a certain state, and previously Bob was only taking that action with a 50% probability, then as it's training, it'll slowly increase that probability then at some point, for example, at above 0.6, it'll stop receiving a signal to further increase the probability of taking that action. And what that does is it kind of stabilizes the algorithm and it prevents Bob from changing his policy too much from trying to copy what Alice is doing. So if we come back down to the ablation studies, we can see that without the BC clipping, it still works pretty well, but there is some instability. For example, in this flip task and in this pick and place, there are parts where it has a big drop in its performance. And that's probably when it tries to change its policy too much to copy exactly what Alice is doing. And in addition to avoiding these kind of big instabilities shown on the graph, it also learns a little bit faster. So that may be from the added stability in general or from it moving more in the path that it's trying to go and less of a zigzaggy overcompensating one way or the other to match what Alice is doing. The next piece we look at is the demonstration filter. So this is the idea that we only use the tasks that Bob failed at as the demonstration tasks. We don't use all of Alice's demonstrations to teach Bob every time. And we can see that this also has a pretty big effect. And it makes sense because Alice is probably moving in a somewhat inefficient manner. If you've seen any of these robot arms during training, they're moving probably a little sporadically and they're not moving directly in the direction that they should go 
to complete the goal. So kind of forcing Bob to follow every one of Alsa's trajectories is gonna hurt him more than just only showing him when he fails a task. And when he succeeds at a task, he can learn how to succeed at that task faster and faster to get earlier and earlier reward without having to follow exactly what Alice did to create that task. So the next one we're gonna look at is the single goal. And this is comparing if we use the algorithm with only a single goal instead of the five goals in a row. And we can see this has a big effect in helping speed up training. When we only set a single goal, it's moving much slower than when we include the five goals. And the reason they give for why this probably is, is that the policy is using an LSTM. So if you look at their model, they're doing a lot to encode the input state, but then they're passing it through this model that uses an LSTM before outputting its action probabilities or its value. So by giving the robot five goals one after the other, it's not resetting the state of its LSTM at the beginning of each of these little sub goals. So it can store information in that state about the environment that can help it better achieve its future goals. So that was the last item in the ablation study. And when you combine all the techniques, you get this black curve. So you may have noticed the X axis on these graphs are the number of training steps it takes. So it's these numbers times 100. So this is 500 steps, this is 1000 steps. So most of the tasks it can accomplish in under 1000 steps or just a little over. And that's pretty impressive. I've tried to train some robot arms myself and it usually takes many more steps for it to accomplish anything sophisticated. And if we look over at the supplemental material provided, we can see how much compute they were actually using. And for this block manipulation task that we were just looking at, they were using quite a few number of CPUs, 64 times 29, which is 1,856 CPUs. But we can still see they're just using a batch size of 4,096, and that's still pretty impressive. They're using a bunch of CPUs, which will probably speed up training, but it looks like each update step is just a batch size of 4,000, which makes the results pretty impressive with how fast the robots learn. Now, if we look over to the shape net object rearrangement task, and these are the more odd shapes, not the blocks, then they're using a lot more compute power. So these are the tasks where they're also taking in visual data. I didn't mention this earlier, but in the block tasks, they're only taking in the state of the blocks and not using the actual visual images of the front camera and the wrist camera. And in the shape net one, they are using that visual information. So they're gonna need some more processing power. So here we got 32 times eight GPUs. That's gonna be 256 GPUs. We have this many CPUs, which is gonna be 16,704 CPUs doing the rollouts of the environment. And the batch size for each training step is a pretty hefty 14,080 steps in the environment. So this is some pretty expensive compute to run the model that takes in the visual information, but that's somewhat expected. And over time, the price of this compute will come down. So it'll just continue to get cheaper to train even more sophisticated robot policies in the future. I think it's just a good sign that we're able to train robots at all to achieve these tasks. Just given a picture of the goal state and having the robot figure out how to get to that goal state from the initial state. So here are just a couple more images from the paper that I found interesting. We saw most of these before. It was that the robot could learn to lift two blocks, lift three blocks, it could learn to lift three and tilt this fourth blue one. It could learn to stack four blocks and balance them on its arm. Then down here, this one's really interesting. Here we're looking at the two types of environments, one where there's only one block, one where there's two blocks. And then as we go to the right, this is Bob learning over time. And as we go down, this is Alice learning over time. So during training, they're just gonna be going along this diagonal. Each step, Bob's gonna get a little better and Alice is going to get a little better. But if we save a checkpoint of each of their policies at that point in time, then at the end of training, we can test, for example, Bob's policy at the third step with Alice's policy at this final step and all the other steps as well. We can create this kind of matrix of seeing how well Bob improves over time and how the tasks get more difficult over time as Alice gets better at making more challenging tasks. So the color represents the success rate. Red is 100% success, blue is 100% failure. And we can see in both cases, there seems to be a little phase transition where Bob goes from not being able to do anything to starting to be able to at least accomplish something on all these tasks. And it seems like over here in the one block case, once he gets past that threshold, he has a pretty good chance of achieving all the tasks and Alice isn't really able to create tasks that are that challenging for Bob. But over here, we see this nice diagonal kind of 
gradient that shows that Alice is continuing to be able to create more and more complicated tasks for Bob to learn from. And this seems like a good feedback signal when you're trying to implement this algorithm to see how well it's training and make sure you're getting something that looks kind of like this, which shows the progress of learning of Bob versus Alice and making sure that both are continuing to progress in their learning. So if Alice kind of stopped being able to create difficult tasks, it would look kind of like this one, where the line just goes straight down. If the line goes straight across, kind of like right here, it's where Bob starts having more and more difficulty learning the task. But I really like this visual, and I think it gives a lot of insight into what's happening in the learning dynamics. And the final image we're going to look at is just one that looks at each of the tasks and sees how well the model can perform on that task. And it looks like all these statistics were for a single policy that's trained over a wide variety of tasks. So we can see it does pretty well with the blocks. The stacking starts to get difficult for it. It can do stacking of two blocks, but stacking three blocks is a lot harder and stacking four blocks, it looks like it couldn't achieve at all. Here we're looking at the YCB objects. And this is just a data set that was created of these type of objects. YCB standing for Yale, Carnegie Mellon University, and Berkeley. So I guess it was a collaboration to create this data set. And we saw some of those objects earlier. I think they were just these gray type of household looking objects. And it does pretty well being able to push around these objects. Again, as you get more and more objects for it to move around, the task will understandably get more difficult. And here we see pick and place. This is where it has to move the objects around and pick one of those objects up in the air. So it does pretty well with just one object. It's a little bit harder with three objects. Then here are the tasks with the customized objects, such as these ones up here. And we can see that the ball capture task which is this one right here with the red balls and the blue and green cylinders was pretty hard. And that makes sense because these balls are hard to control. They could just roll off the table. So you could think if in real life you're doing a task with round objects, you might want to make a tabletop like felt or some padding that adds more friction to make these tasks easier to solve. And if we look at these other tasks, mini chess, dominoes, the table setting task, the tangram task, it seems to do pretty well. And then it starts having trouble with the rainbow task. So the more arcs that it has to add to the rainbow, the more difficult it gets. And it starts off with just the red and then the red and orange, red, orange, and yellow. And that also kind of makes sense because it has to do more complicated planning. It can't just move one object and then the next. It kind of has to move the red one first, then the orange, and then kind of push them all in at the end. Whereas with these other tasks, it can move the plate first, then this fork, then this spoon. It doesn't need to be as sophisticated in its strategy. And that I also found insightful. If you can somehow make the task so that the robot has to be less sophisticated in the order of operations to achieve that task, it'll probably make it easier. And perhaps if it is a complicated task, you could just break it up into these smaller goal steps that the robot could get those pieces into and then add the next piece and so on and so on without having to figure out a complex strategy just from looking at the end goal state and the initial state with all the pieces scattered. So here we are at the conclusion and the author or authors mention that they still have to solve the sim to real problem. So it works in simulation. They're given state information about the objects. They're not just only using visual information. And in the real world, they won't have the state information about the objects probably. And also they'll have to do that transfer from sim to real, which can be hard to do. But there has been success in the past from OpenAI's robotic hand where they did domain randomization. They just kind of perturbed the parameters of the environment to make it easier for the robot to generalize to the real world. So for example, tweaking the gravity, tweaking the friction, tweaking the different parameters of the robot, randomize those a bit for each episode to make the robot more robust so that whatever the parameters were in the real world, it would be able to handle those as well, even though they could be different than they are in the simulation, most likely will. And on top of that, they could add in some fine tuning on the actual physical robot to make Bob more robust to the physical robot that it will actually be used in. So those were the main interesting things I got out of this paper. I'll link to it in the description if you want to check it out. If you want to look into more of the details about the actual architecture of the network or how it's representing the state space or its action space, it has details about that in there. And I think I'll probably try to implement some version of this algorithm or at least some parts of it in the future. So if I do, I'll make a video about that and I'll post it on my channel. And that's all for this video. I will see you guys next time. Hope you had a good time.